Hello everyone, welcome. This is a very important video and a very late video, but it's a coronavirus special. We're here to... We talked about the movies, we talked about the state of the movies and the industry and how everything's been affected, but now we're actually going to do a, a top 10 of 2019. This is because I never did this last year and it's just unprecedented times and I started this channel a little late and whatever, we're going to do it now and I think that my list will make everyone hopefully feel a little better during these times. Anyway, so we'll start with the honorable mentions. I have a lot of honorable mentions. Jojo Rabbit. Jojo Rabbit is not a movie that I by any means thought was great. I just thought it got the message across, it was suitable for all ages, and it was funny. And even when it wasn't funny, it still showed signs of having passion and having detail. And it's one of the better movies to show that for all ages. And I thought this was a really accessible movie, and it was fun. And it's a topic that usually wouldn't be considered fun. So with that, it's one of the more enjoyable films of the year. On the other list, I mean on the next on list of honorable mentions, is Booksmart. This is directed by Olivia Wilde in her debut, and for a debut, it's a killer. Olivia Wilde directs this movie wonderfully. Beanie Feldstein, Catherine Deaver give great performances. Her husband, Jason Sudeikis, is really funny in this movie. As is Diana Silvers, Jessica Williams, Skylar Gisando, and Billy Lord. This is a really clever movie. It plays with the tropes. It remixes them. Classic movie cliches from, you know, teen comedies like Ferris Bueller's. And it really remixes it for 2019. It's a well-thought-out movie that just really seemed to knock me off my seat. I saw this in theaters, and I never really say that, but I saw this my senior year, and I saw it a couple of days before I graduated. I just remember watching this. It was surreal. It was a beautiful movie, well done, really captured what it was like to be in high school. Great job done by all. El Camino. This is the Vince Gilligan-directed Breaking Bad film. I could not make a list without including a Vince Gilligan film if I had the opportunity. He's an artist. He's an auteur. While many are out there making, you know, TV shows that have cliffhanger endings and really cheesy, hammy moments there to keep you guessing, Vince Gilligan never, ever backed down from a smart move. Everything he's done is very calculated. All the suspenseful moments in his shows are very calculated and clever and it shows it shows because El Camino is really just a two-hour episode of Breaking Bad it's not action-packed but when it is it it's suspenseful and it works so well it's a great movie Fire this is a documentary I actually saw in theaters yeah, it came out on Netflix. I watched this while I was working at my movie theater job. So behind the desk, popcorn stand, I just had this on an iPad with headphones in. Uh, interesting experience, to say the least. This is like the social network. I love movies like this. I love movies that try to inform you and try to have a really creative energy when they do it. That's fire. It's a lot of fun. And it really just is a blast. Ford versus Ferrari. This was also a really fun action movie it's a sports film but it really takes you inside these races it's about the Le Mans 66 race and Ken Miles and Carroll Shelby teaming up to build a really fast race car it's nothing special it's just James Mangold delivers a crisp uh, technically riveting movie and it's got everything from great soundtrack to beautiful cinematography it's totally worth the watch. High Life and Under the Silver Lake. Here are two more honorable mentions. High Life is a French film by Claire Denis that follows a bunch of astronauts in space as they are sending prisoners out there, and it's a weird, weird film. This came out in 2018 at the New York Film Festival, and I didn't get to see it, and I was really annoyed about that, so I saw it. When this came out on 420, and it was crazy. Um, it's just a very strange film. I saw this almost a year ago, actually, which is wow, a while ago. It's one of the earlier movies I saw that year, and it's just a very trippy, different type of movie. It reminded me a lot of Stalker and Solaris, so 
It's good for that. Tarkovsky references. Under the Silver Lake, David Robert Mitchell, the director of It Follows, delivers this wham, bam of a glitzy opus. I mean, this is very, very dense, very layered. I was not shocked when many people didn't like this. Although every single, every single critic will have a different opinion of this one. This isn't a movie that I immediately think you can either love or hate. I just think it's one you can watch and have to immediately reconsider. This is like Mulholland Drive. It's very trippy, very a tapestry of ideas. Some of them are great. Some of them just kind of make you wonder how they got put in the film. But I think it's a very impressive movie. Either way, it's an oddball of a film and it's just worth checking out it's you can't take your eyes off under the silver lake uncut gems last of my honorable mentions it's um adam sandler the sappy brothers a24 you would think that just by saying that i've given you a pretty simple review and i haven't said much and i have i did not give you that much information but this is a really well-crafted movie my parents hated it i remember even seeing this the first time and saying why was that so loud why was that so like all over the place like this like i can't oh hi i'm adam sandler yeah that's what the movie was like it was really unfun to watch at times and i saw this at its premiere i went to see it at a screening at new york film festival the Safdies introduced it i think that's what made my experience kind of bad i ran to pee and i came back and the Safdies were speaking and i was just like when is the movie gonna start and then i had to pee like right away i can't blame my bladder for the actual film being not great but i just remember the anxiety but that is still something that you could just say about a movie if it gives you kind of a nervous sense this didn't really make me nervous it just kind of made me wonder what's gonna happen because i was very tense during the film i think that was just my experience though i really think the movie itself was good just could have been a little shorter, honestly. Good Time was 97 minutes. Perfect movie. Perfect movie. Yeah. All right, now we're getting on to the top 12. This is my official list for best of the year. These are 12 movies I absolutely smashingly loved. Number 12, Waves. Trey Edward Schultz directed Waves, and it's, it's great. Waves is a movie that's basically two halves. There's one story and then another story, and they connect but they are just really well shot and told and it's really personal and it's not something i related to in any way in fact his last two movies Krisha and it comes at night were both very dark and dismal but i love both of them for separate reasons it comes at night was just a memory i saw with my dad but also it was really a morbid kind of haunting movie and it really made me look at the future and just made me look at also just how you see movies with people I saw with my dad. And I don't think he liked it, but it was just an experience. And then seeing Krisha was phenomenal. I absolutely love Krisha. With Waves, it's a very moving, long look at a family. But it's clearly just the director, writer putting his passion on screen and it shows. Trey Edward Schultz is a force when it comes to visual art and music and i cannot wait to see what he has next number 11 the beach bum very similar to waves but not as depressing the beach bum is kind of waves is more fun sister it's directed by harmony kareen who does movies that are always a mix of um soapy kind of tragic comedy and he mixes that with dark violent crime sometimes that's his genre. The Beach Bum is great because it's just about the life of a stoner, played by Matthew McConaughey, living in Miami. And it feels like Harmony Kareem's letter to the people about himself. He's saying he used to make great movies, but now he doesn't think people take him seriously anymore. And that's really the message. It's really just a fun movie about living life, having a good time. And I loved it. I thought The Beach Bum was really well casted it was really well shot i mean he clearly had a blast just getting high and filming all these nice locations this is one i could have seen in theaters but it wasn't ever playing near me i mean i had 
freaking movies like Tomb Raider and The Greatest Showman playing and I don't get to see movies like The Beach Bum because you have to go drive 30 minutes. This was just really, really good and it shows that Matthew McConaughey is just doing everything he can. This feels like his full form. Um, it's really funny. It's got Martin Lawrence in a great role. It's just fantastic. Okay, let's move on. Number 10, Midsummer. I loved Midsummer. Midsummer is really weird, really creepy, really strange, just out there. I can't even say Midsummer is one of the best of the year. It just grabbed my attention. It has these thrills for everything from Polanski to Bergman to Wes Craven. This is a awesome horror movie. It's really cool and it's really, really um, disturbing in some ways. It doesn't continually be, it's not continually disturbing. I just think it, it's able to open up with a really strong atmosphere and it kind of hooks you and then from there it builds off it. It's not great. It's never really constantly seething with fear and tension, but when it does, you'll know, and it just works towards that respect, towards that aesthetic. It's it's a nasty, and it knows what it's doing. Midsummer is a long, kind of, I don't think everyone will love it. I think you might be disappointed by the end, as I initially was, but overall, I thought it was just very fun and weird, and it's it's creepy in that sense that it knows it's out there and off. I like you, Ari Aster, you weird, foofy, horror genius. All right, let's move on. Another genius, Noah Baumbach, with Marriage Story at number nine. Noah Baumbach is a great artist. Some of his best work has been Francis Ha. Um, he's done movies, Kicking and Screaming, and he's just shown, and Squid and the Whale is one of my favorites, he's shown that he can really capture how people act and how people talk and that's what marriage story is it's a movie about people who are getting a divorce played by adam driver played by scarlett johansson and we follow their relationship it's just a really not sad movie but it's really honest and i think that's where it gets you in it the way it depicts people and relationships obviously the performances are amazing but the writing and the way they're portrayed is by far the best part about this film. The editing is also superb. All right, number eight, Dragged Across Concrete. By far and away, one of my favorite movies of 2019, Dragged Across Concrete is a masterclass of neo-noir crime thrillers. S. Craig Zoller directs this, and it's one of the best of the year. It's a crime film about two detectives played by Vince Vaughn, and played by Mel Gibson, and saying anything else would really be a spoiler. I mean, I went into this knowing pretty much just that plot point a little more, but that's all I really needed to know to really love the film. I think right from the first five minutes I was interested. It doesn't even have a really cool opening shot. I just think it's the really raw and... and passionate way he shoots this, Zoller shoots this, that you just get hooked right from the beginning. Because it's a long movie, but it's one I can sit through. I can sit through a long movie knowing it's going to constantly be leaving me wanting more. That's how this film is. About an hour and 20 minutes, something happens in this long movie that just left me like, oh my god. It's, it's great. Okay, number seven, The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse is terrific. Robert Pattinson, Willem Dafoe, a creaky old black and white lighthouse. I mean, this is one I had tickets to see at the Angelica. My friend Marcus saw this at the Angelica, and I didn't go. I ended up watching it at home, which I completely regret, because my local theater ended up showing it after I saw it. I was rightfully pissed. But The Lighthouse is just a immersive horror film. It's unlike anything you see made today, because... It's so location-based, and it's so not typical for horror films. I mean, this is a movie about two men basically going insane in a lighthouse. Uh, it's like a two-hour episode of Twilight Zone. However, it is really well-crafted, 
And it's just, that's all I gotta say. See this fucking movie. Number six, 1917. Let's get this out of the way. I, I know there's things in here that are not good. I've had, I've had professors say they hated this movie, that thought it was awful. They thought it was a complete gimmick and a joke. And I get that. I get that it's awards bait, and I get that it can be very sluggish, and it can be very, almost like an amusement park. But I said, and I said this is my first time I watched this, I really enjoyed it. I really got involved in it. And when I did watch it, I thought it was like an amusement park. I thought it was a fun amusement park. Sure, it had its moments where it stopped. There's the scene where they go to get breast milk or something. There's scenes where they just walk for 20 minutes, and that can all be cut. But overall, 1917 is a fun, engaging movie that knows it has a gimmick and it just plays to its strengths. There's movies like Dunkirk that are way more dynamic and I think, sure, it may be better, but Dunkirk is certainly, I mean, 1917 is certainly fun and it's certainly one of the most immersive films of this year. Number five, The Irishman. Now, I saw The Irishman and I saw 1917 both in theaters. The Irishman may have stood out to me more just because of the memory I had seen it at its premiere. I saw Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and Joe Pesci, all three of them, crossing the street before my premiere even started. They were going to the Walter Reed Theater, and I said, oh, Robert, come back. And I saw Joe Pesci get in the car. He gave me a wave. He had a goatee, and he lit a cigarette as he was getting in his car. And I just remember that. I mean, should I even talk about The Irishman? Because the actual movie is very good, but you can check out my review for that. Okay, number four, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I put this over The Irishman. I, I had a better time watching The Irishman, but I think Portrait of a Lady on Fire is maybe more memorable for some people. Because The Irishman is also a... It harkens back to American cinema, and it is about loneliness, and it is an epic about, about family and how you can lose those people... But I think Portrait of Lady on Fire is more universally relevant because it doesn't involve the Teamsters or Jimmy Hoffa. And it's also just a love story. Portrait of Lady on Fire is really well-crafted love story, so it's probably more timeless. Uh, it's one of the better movies of the year, though. The quality of it and the pristine direction. I really wish I saw this one in theaters. I never got the chance to. But I saw it at home, and I really enjoyed this movie. Number three, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. If you asked me back in July, before I saw this, what did I think of it? I'd say I'm so excited for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm, I'm almost as excited as I was for Avengers Endgame, and that was disappointing. So when I saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and I saw the end of it, I left the theater, and I remember even waving goodbye to my friend Alex, taking some popcorn with me, my friend in the theater, who managed the theater, and I said to him, have a good night, and everyone was leaving, like, we thought it was about Charlie Manson, everyone was saying that. I think that was probably the defining point of opening and Thursday night viewings, was I thought this was a Charlie Manson movie. I'm really not trying to go into spoilers, but that was how I felt. The day after, I felt a love for the movie. The day after that, I really felt the love for the movie, and it just kept growing. This is a love that kept metastasizing, kept getting bigger and bigger, and eventually I just said, I, I love this movie. It's my number one movie of the year. But that changes, because more, more movies come out, and you get more experiences. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, though, is easily one of the best experiences of 2019. I think it's the best. I saw this in theaters more than any other film. I've crashed many other showings, too. I haven't gone to any movie properly since this while this was in theaters. I remember Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark was out in Lion King in Cape Cod when I went to go see those. I left both those movies and went to go see someone once upon a time in Hollywood just to enjoy it while I can. It was so fun seeing it up on the screen. I just remember the enjoyment I got actually going before it came out on Blu-ray in November. And it played up until the last day of September in or the last week of September at my home theater so I just got used to seeing that movie it's one of the better experiences of the year number two my second favorite film of the year Little Women 
I would never have expected this to be my favorite, second favorite of the year, especially, especially after seeing Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But I saw it, and my thoughts were just, I have to make this my second favorite because I had so much fun, and this was such a good adaptation. It's also very on par with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in terms of ensemble casting and production. They're very neck and neck. You, you might argue that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is more scrambled, which it is. It's a totally different film. This is very neat. It's very set, and it's very cut, um, expertly spliced. This is a sharp movie. Greta Gerwig is adapting it. It's very fast. It's fluent. And for a period film, it really flies. This is a movie that has been told so many times, and I think because it was my first exposure to it, I loved it. I mean, I just really felt the warmth of this movie. It's a warm movie. It's a Christmas movie. It's something you can watch with your whole family. It's very sweet. It's about sisters and their relationship. And I just thought it was great. And now my number one movie of the year, which is everyone's favorite movie of the year, Parasite. First, let's just pick the bone. There's the biggest elephant in the room that I just need to throw out the window, and that's this won Best Picture. This was the first, it was the first of many films. Uh, here's the thing. It, first foreign film to win Best Picture. First movie to win the Palme d'Or at Cannes. And then to go home and take Best Picture. It's also the first Korean film, I think, to be nominated. And, no, to, or to win. But the crazy thing there is there are, please listen, there are so many good Korean movies. One of my favorite movies from last year was not Parasite. It was the only foreign movie on my top 10 list. And Roma almost made it, but I like this a lot better. Burning. When I saw Burning in January of 2019, I said, well, I mean, 2018 was great. And, uh, you know, there were some really good movies, but I think Burning will be the number one. So point is, there's always great movies, but the Academy doesn't recognize them because they would rather recognize Joker and Jojo Rabbit and movies that will attract attention. Um, they want movies that will buy ad space. They don't really care necessarily that they're fast movies. So the best movies for Best Picture don't always get nominated. I would have loved to see Knives Out land nomination. I'm glad Bombshell didn't. That movie was so ugh, boring. But when we talk about a film that's great, I will look write a movie like Parasite for being thrilling, funny, and just completely knocking me off my ass. I had no idea what to expect. Um, but yeah, those are my favorites of the year, guys.